Well, tonight we're gonna, today we're going to jump into our series, uh, the last message of our series of Renew. Um, we've been talking about biblical response to mental health, and uh, we're going to kind of wrap it up today. And if you have missed any of the series, um, they're all on our YouTube channel. They're on our website. You can go back and get that. Today we're going to look at a message that we're titling um, From Pain to Purpose, because I want to empower our church. I want to empower the church to serve and care for those who are struggling. And our theme verse uh, in this whole thing has been uh, Romans 12, 2. It says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renew- renewing of your mind. You know, it's a big deal in our country, mental health. One in five adults in the U.S. Experience, uh, in the US experiences mental health issues each year. That's 20%. Half of all Americans will struggle with mental illness at some point in their lives. No one is immune from dealing with mental health, including believers. And this doesn't even include the statistics that are coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, the stress-induced experiences that people have been walking through. And I personally believe that before we get to the end of our pandemic, which I believe, and I'm speaking in faith, that we're coming to the end of, I think we're going to see even more statistics that are scary about how domestic abuse, drug abuse, violence have been on the rise in this season. We all know that the suicides have increased exponentially in this season. There's so many things that have become overwhelming. Mental illness and mental health is not something we can make light of, and it's not something we can ignore. Rob Ketterling pastors a great church in Minnesota. He says, many people are occupied, but not many are fulfilled. We have lots of people that are living. They're busy and they're around us. But very few people are living with a purpose and on a mission. But I thank God. I thank God for the church. Because the church helps us focus our mission in life. I think that's where the church really comes in. I, if, if, if it, it will be our job as a church, our job as a people of God, to help people find hope and fulfillment in life. You know, there's a lot of ways to stay busy, but busy does not mean you're purposeful. Busy does not mean you're on mission. That's again why I love the the soup outreach, and I love the house of blessing that we do, uh, you know, three times a week. And I, I love the, the turkey basket giveaway. Why? Because that is on mission for who God's called us to be. Anytime we reach out beyond ourselves, it helps us to be on mission for who God has called us to be. You know, I, I know many people that uh, have struggled with anxiety and depression. I've seen marriages destroyed due to mental illness. I've seen people that have attempted to self-medicate. I've visited people that have had to be institutionalized. And sadly, I've known people who have even taken their own life because of fear, anxiety, depression, being overwhelmed with the things of life. The reality is that mental illness does not discriminate. And I believe that not everything that happens in our life is God's will. You know, we we oftentimes hear people say things like, well, God's will be done. But I will tell you this as a fact, is that God's will isn't done every day. It's, It's, the Bible tells us very clear that it's his desire that all would know him. He doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell without knowing him. But every day people die and go to hell without knowing Jesus. Is that the will of God? No. Every day we experience things that are not part of the will of God. It's the results of living in, the, living in a fallen world filled with sin. Does that say all illness is a result of sin in your life? No. But because the sin in this world that was introduced in Adam and Eve, we live in an imperfect world. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came so that we could have that perfect bridge back into the Father's grace and goodness. But we understand that so many people struggle. I believe that 
God can turn bad things into good things. God never wants to waste our hurts. We talked about that yesterday at our men's breakfast. We're not going to get too much into that, but God never wants to waste our hurts. The Bible tells us that what the devil meant for evil, God meant for good. But in the moment, we might not actually understand what's the good that's coming out of this hurt. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 says this. It says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are troubled. We will, all, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. You know, we have four kind of goals in this message today, kind of things I would like to accomplish today. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on what is the purpose or the purposes of the church when it comes to mental health. The first thing I want to talk about with mental health in the church is that the church must take the lead. We as a church cannot be afraid to talk about the need of mental health. And I'm not talking about what the government or education or even healthcare agency does. Those are all good things, but there's, there's things that we as a church need to do. We need to take the lead in letting people know that we care, that we love, that we walk through life with them. But often, what we do is we insulate ourselves so much that we're not able to reach out to those around us that you can see them hurting. We don't want to get involved. And I, I, I just, every time I think about this, I think about the story of the Good Samaritan. And you're familiar with it, and it's, it's in the Gospels. <coughs> Man's beaten and robbed, left for dead. Priests walk by him and ignore him. Relig religious leaders walk by him and ignore him. Because they don't want to get, they don't want to be bothered, don't want to be uh, unclean. But then the Samaritan, who's considered inferior, unworthy, not righteous, stops, binds the man's wounds, takes him to a hotel, pays for his care, and returns to pay for any bills that weren't covered. But oftentimes, here on a Sunday morning, we're in, out, and gone. Because we're in a rush. Maybe you're sitting at home sometimes. This happens to me frequently. Somebody pops into your head. And you think, oh, I should call them. Let me encourage you. Call them. Because anytime that happens to me, you know what I assume? I assume it's the Holy Spirit telling me, this person needs a call. And it's amazing when you do that, how often they'll say, oh, I'm so glad you called. I needed someone to talk to. Or, oh, I, you know, I don't really need to talk, but could you pray for this? But it takes us stepping out of our comfort zone, stepping out of our daily routine, and focusing on the, the needs of others. You know, the, one of the reasons that we have to take the lead as a church is that it's a biblical reason. A good portion of Jesus' ministry dealt with the needs of other people. Not just their spiritual needs, but their physical needs. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 tells us, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the, the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He did preaching, that's, that's evangelism, right? He did teaching, that's education, and then he healed. That's, it was Jesus' health care system. Jesus was a pretty good health care provider. He didn't just care about our souls going to heaven and our minds learning the truth. He cared about our bodies as well. Jesus' ministry clearly dealt with people that were both physically and mentally ill. Our ministry should do the same thing. The other reason we should lead is it's a historical reason. The church has a 2,000-year history of caring for the sick. The first hospitals were not invented by health care agencies or by the government, but by the church. If you go back to where the first missionaries went into many foreign lands, you'll find that the first hospital in that area was started by a Christian missionary. I believe God is calling the church today to a holistic ministry that cares for the body, the mind, 
and the Spirit. It might look different than how the physical poverty of the world is addressed, but I promise you, spiritual poverty is just as bad as physical poverty. And God has called us as a church to lead the way in caring for others. It's also a practical reason. When you talk to people who are in pain, people often contact their church before they go anywhere else. And I think that's a good thing. When someone's in pain and they're in conflict in their family, the first call often goes to a spiritual leader or a pastor. They don't call an attorney. They don't call the police or the doctor. And we know from experience as spiritual leaders and as pastors in our church that people need care 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It allows us to meet the needs of people when we as a church lead in that. One of the things that I, as the pastor of the church, have been considering is that I, I, I need some help. I need help. Listen, our pastoral staff's wonderful. They work hard, they're dedicated, they're committed, but I really believe God has called us to raise up new leaders. And so in this next year, we're going to be working on developing pastoral care teams that are empowered to work alongside the pastors. Are we going to call them pastors? I don't know. I don't know. We may, maybe we'll just start calling them elders of the church. But there are things that God has placed inside of you to help those that are hurting. And he never expected all of that to fall on the pastors. Because God has put great things inside of you. He's called us to minister. If you look at what Ephesians 4 says, my job really is to equip the people of God for works of service. I believe God's calling us to care for the needs of others. The other thing the church has to do is that we have to remove the stigma or the fear of talking about mental health. Why do you think people are hesitant to talk about mental illness? The real issue is either they're embarrassed, afraid, ashamed that they need help in this area. Now follow me on this, okay? I want you to follow this. If my liver stops working properly, I can go to the doctor and get a pill to take care of it or go to the doctor and get diagnosed. And if my heart stops working right, I can go to the doctor and get diagnosed, get it taken care of. And we don't fear telling other people about it. If we break a bone, um, unless we've done something incredibly stupid, we don't worry about telling people how we broke that bone. It's pretty obvious when we have a cast on our arm that we've done it. But for some reason, there's no stigma about talking about a, 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 a liver issue, a heart issue, a broken bone. But if my brain is sick, I have to keep it a secret that I needed a professional to help. Rick Warren, many of you know who Rick Warren is. He's a well-known pastor and he's uh, pastor of, uh, the author of A Purpose Driven Life. In 2013, his own son took his life. That day, Pastor Rick wrote this in his journal. It says, in God's garden of grace, even broken trees bear fruit. Your body doesn't work perfectly. Your mind doesn't work perfectly. No relationship works perfectly. So we need to remove the fear and the stigma. And we need to understand it is not a sin to be sick. Even spiritual leaders struggle with fear and depression. I've known and admired many successful pastors who have admitted that they've struggled with depression. Their goal was not Oh God, help me build a great church. Their goal was God, get me through this Sunday. Most of them have shared that they were glad they never gave up. But they were even more glad that God never gave up on them. Did you know that even the great Charles Spurgeon struggled with a deep depression? In this season of COVID, we've heard more and more stories from pastors around our, our state of struggling with being overwhelmed, feeling inadequate, inferior, depressed. We're hearing it more and more. There's a, there's, there's a big worry. And oftentimes all we can tell them is, keep going, God is faithful. Keep going, God is faithful. But I thank Jesus that they're willing to acknowledge the challenge. Because oftentimes we are fearful of that 
And I want to say to you right now, if you feel like giving up, don't. God brought you to a point in time. He brought you to this point in time because He has a message of hope for you. We all know that mental illness is very complex, and so it has to be addressed on multiple levels. And that we need to deal with the we all, we need to deal with the rational and the relational and the social aspects that involves our friends and our families. Because our problems don't just affect us; they affect those around us, and the problem of those around us affect us. Then, of course, we have to deal with it on a spiritual level as well. See, this is important because it's it's it involves knowing. Jesus in the power of faith and building strong spiritual habits and resisting the devil and dealing with spiritual oppression that comes from the evil forces around us. And the reality is, it's not a matter of one or the other. You don't just deal with mental health issues in a counseling setting. You need counseling, professional help, and you need prayer. Body, mind, and spirit. And when we try and deal with them just as one or the other, we're missing the wholeness of who God desires for us to be. You know, we have ministries, many of our ministries and groups, they do a great job of helping us. Uh, a few of the ministries, like our altar workers, they, you know, they, they, we highlight them every single Sunday. Why? Because we believe in the power of prayer. We believe in the power of God to change your life. You know, we have grief share. It's a great opportunity for those that are walking through uh, the loss of a loved one. We have small groups that build relationships that help you feel as though you are not isolated in this world. One of the ways that we struggle, one of the reasons we struggle with mental illness oftentimes is because we have isolated ourselves so far that nobody can speak into our lives and come alongside us. How many times do I say, you're not meant to walk through this life alone? But how many times do we choose to do that? Because we're afraid or embarrassed. Because like Cain, we compare ourselves to Abel. When we compare ourselves to others, it breeds either inferiority or jealousy. It also can breed superiority too. Where you feel as though you're better than somebody else. Thank God I'm not like the tax collector. Thank God I'm not like this person. I'm doing better than they are. That doesn't mean you're doing good. Just because you're doing better than somebody else. This is the point I want to say. I've heard so many times people say, just pray, just read the Bible. Listen, I, and that's part of it. I've also heard people say, you know, just go to a doctor, get a pill, see a counselor. All of that could be part of it. But the reality is, it's usually all of it. We need spiritual growth, relational accountability, and medical help. The other purpose that we need to recognize as we talk to mental health is this. The church must release people to minister. It's not just about the professional clergy. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 says this, So Christ Himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip His people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Often those struggling, or the families of those struggling with mental illness, often feel overwhelmed and don't know where to turn. You are welcome to turn to the church, to our altar teams, to the pastors here. But it's one of the reasons why I think this this uh, group that we've partnered with called Talk Sunday, we've talked about it several times, is so important. It's Christian counselors that we have had the opportunity to, to vet and make sure that they're actually Christian counselors. Faith-based counseling that recognizes professional uh, skills and techniques along with the truth of Scripture and prayer. And you can learn a little bit more about Talk Sunday. Um, you can go to talksunday.com forward slash get started, or we have a card out at the guest welcome desk where you can learn a little bit more about walking through these things. The pastors are always available for your, for your needs. You're not meant to walk through this life alone. Our small groups teams, our ministry teams, our outreach events, these are all places for you to build relationships so that you're not isolated. And I'm sorry if you can walk into our church and not be greeted. It can happen. It can happen. Our church is very friendly. But I want us to be more than friendly. I want us to be caring. You know, we can be friendly without being caring, right? At the same time, you have to participate. Be the change that you desire to see in other people. If you walk in and you feel that no one greets you, go greet them. 
I have never seen anybody get bit here. Maybe in the nursery, but... Um, you are not meant to walk through this life alone. I say it week after week. But we know from the research and studies that are being done that people feel more isolated than ever. You're not meant to walk through this life alone. We want to be a church that loves people in sickness and in health. We want to be known for helping people who are struggling. Is it just me? Or maybe you feel this way too. Why does it seem that God tends to heal physical ailments immediately far more often than mental ailments? This is what I, this is what I think. Some healings were meant to come over a period of time through the strengthening of the body of Christ, not just prayer, but by others coming alongside you. Some of the most miraculous healings I've ever seen are, are when other people that have experienced the hurt come alongside somebody and help lift them up. Because sometimes my faith isn't enough. I need the faith of somebody else. You know, it's actually one of the reasons that I'm so, I, I share the story of Bennett's adoption frequently. I mean, we, we share the testimony of God's faithfulness, but we also can share the pain and the hurt of walking through infertility. And I do, part of the reason we do it is I want families to know that we are willing to walk with you through difficult times. I've seen marriages restored simply because a couple that has already walked through a hardship was willing to come alongside a couple currently walking through a hardship. Our pain can serve a purpose if we are willing to share it. But that only happens when we let go of our pain and hold on to the healing found in Jesus. We can lift others up through our own redemptive story of what God has done when we're willing to make ourselves vulnerable and share the testimony of what God has done in you. And sometimes it hurts because you feel like you're reliving it. But I promise you this, as you focus on the needs of others, God will heal you even more. Maybe it's time for some of us to... Thank you. Maybe it's time for some of us to look past our pain and start looking for others that are hurting and share the victory that God has brought about. Mental illness, like physical illness, is not always cured. But the church can help people learn how to live with those illnesses and draw closer to God in the midst of it. You know, Paul, in the Bible, we don't know what it is, he refers to a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed multiple times for that flesh, for that thorn to be removed, and it never was. We don't know what it was, but we do know that healing is not always received on this side of heaven. When somebody is in the midst of a mental illness and they tell you about their struggle, the chances are they're not looking for advice. They're actually looking for somebody to support them on their journey. They're looking for somebody to walk with them. They need somebody to go arm in arm, hand in hand, and say, I'm here for you. Finally, the fourth thing that the church has to do when it comes to mental health is the church must be supportive. If you're struggling with mental illness, I want to say right here that we care about your pain. If you're ready to throw up your hands and say, I don't know which way to turn, let me as your friend, your pastor, share a few important statements of hope. First, I want you to understand this, that your illness is not your identity. If you struggle with anxiety, fear, depression other mental illnesses, your identity. Your illness is not your identity. Your chemistry is not your character. It does not define you. You may struggle with your mental illness, but it is not who you are. You're a child of God. If you're a follower of Christ, your identity is Jesus Christ. Remember, you are wonderfully complex. You know, we previously had hosted a a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. 
It's a ministry that helps people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And it's very different than Alcohols and Alcoholics Anonymous. This is how Alcoholics Anonymous begins their meeting. It's, hi, I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic. They identify with their struggle or pain or loss. In Celebrate Recovery, it's, my name is Bob. I'm a believer who struggles with alcohol. See the difference? The primary identity is not their illness. The primary identity is their creator, Jesus Christ. The one who made you has a purpose and a plan for your life. The second thing we need to know is that God knew your struggle long before you did. We live in a broken world. We're not in heaven yet. God knew that you would be hearing this message today. A thousand years before you were born, he knew it. And I believe that he wants you to sit down and just be quiet long enough so that he can come along and say, you matter to me. I see the pain. I see the torment in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. And I have grieved with you. I have wept with you. I love you. I created you. Jesus wants you to hear that today. I want you to know today that you are valuable to God. You are acceptable to God. You are lovable and forgivable and you are usable. You have a purpose. And God wants to take you from pain to give you purpose. This morning, if you feel like your pain that you're facing is a wall that's just too high to scale, I want to say to you that on the other side of the wall is your future. And we want to help you get there. The greatest stories are comeback stories. But you can't have a comeback without a setback. That's why I think one of the greatest movies ever made is Rocky III. You laugh, but it's true. Rocky thought he was doing great. Didn't take the fight with Clubber Lang seriously. Got his tail kicked. Knockout in the third round. I cry every time Mickey dies. Honest to goodness. Peter Pan movies and Rocky Three. Don't know what it is. Just being real honest with you. But what's he do? Presses in. Refocuses. He had a setback. What you're going through right now is not the end of your life. It's a season of your life. It's not the end. And the most important thing as a Christian is this. You don't have to do it by yourself. The walls in your life, there are those that are willing to help you to get over them. And I want to leave you with these three verses. That they're the commission not only for our church, but for every church in the world. And it's a reminder. Perhaps you do not struggle with mental illness. Therefore, it's hard for you to identify with those that do. That's okay. You don't have to have a struggle to support somebody through it. Perhaps you have a challenge that you're facing and you're overwhelmed. But I want you to understand this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says this. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. We are called to help one another. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 says this. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out for only your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You see somebody hurting. You stop like the Samaritan. How can I help you? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14 says this. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid. Take tender care of those who are weak. Be patient with everyone. My hope today is that as we finish this series, we just end a sermon series, but we start a spiritual revolution of hope and healing. Everyone has struggles and challenges. Everyone needs more of Jesus. Some problems are more obvious than others. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus is calling you 
into a deeper relationship with Him. We as a church are called to walk alongside those that are struggling, to lift them up, to walk arm in arm, hand in hand with our brothers and sisters that need more of Jesus. Hope is found in the presence of God. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, for those that are heavy burdened, walking through life, feeling alone, as though no one understands, Jesus, I pray for your presence. Jesus, I pray for your healing. Jesus, I pray that we as a church would continue to grow in caring and reaching out, in loving those within our body that have needs, physical, mental, spiritual. You care about the whole person. And so Jesus, this morning, call us to be the people that reach out in love. Show us how to lock arms together and walk forward into your glory. Jesus, be with us today. Heal us today. For those that are carrying burdens, I just pray for your Holy Spirit to minister right now. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus into lives, circumstances, and situations. Jesus, be with them. Be with us. Be here today. In your precious name. Amen.